So thank you, Charlie, for your talk. And are there any questions? Yes. So this is loud. kind of a random question. Loud, Sorry. loud. Uh, loud. Loud, okay. Yes. You know, as I was listening to Charlie talk, I was looking at our altar, altar mural up there, mm -hmm. and I was looking at the top of the Buddha's head, and it looks like there's like a little smoke cloud that's coming out of the top of the Buddha's mm -hmm. head. <laughs> random, you know, do you know what that is? <laughs> <laughs> I used to know. <laughs> <laughs> Stan, do you know? I forgot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the Buddha's head is covered with snails who are protecting him from the heat. So those are not, you know, really cool curls. They're snails. <laughs> and then in the middle, this is the third eye stuff. So in the middle is like this very strong power oh, thing. Power yeah. Shock. Yeah, and um, there are there in the sutras. There's a lot of stuff um, where um, between the so one of the marks of the Buddha is the eye, eyebrows are sort of continuous, and that uh, there's sort of a bump in the middle, and that that's another power spot, and that beams of light come out of that. So I know about the beams of light coming out between you know the eyebrows, but I don't know about the smoke <laughs> coming out. maybe because the world is on fire right <laughs> you know yeah it was very interesting with the online song of this this so this heart kilche um uh the heart kilche is a is a chance there's a it's a 90-day period regular kilche is like a 90-day retreat very intensive 90-day retreat. So heart kilche is, well, you can't sit the 90-day retreat, but you can do something extra. You can focus more on your practice. So, um, yeah, so there was, uh, and there were people from all over the world and what extra things they were gonna do. And some people was, I'm gonna sit five minutes a day, and some people was gonna be, nobody actually said this, but I'm gonna do a thousand bows a day, you know, is, like and no judgment it's just everybody you know makes a commitment of what they're going to do and uh, you know there was a guy who was from moscow and you know you can't you know he's in the middle of this fire yeah. and i kept thinking is he going to be up in the army why like what's going to happen to him you know there was there was nobody there was one woman from turkey but no one else from anywhere in the middle east there was no one from ukraine but you know, this world is really on fire. I mean, have you read what's going on in Sudan? It's incredible. It's completely horrible. And nobody even knows about it in this country. BBC is very good for this stuff. But all over this world, fire after fire after fire after fire. And how do we live with this? knowledge and how do we alleviate the suffering the wonderful thing about the mahayana is you know we have a tendency um people who were raised in monotheistic religions we think of everybody as an individual and so we think it's our job to do everything. We can't do everything and then we give up. But in the in Mahayana Buddhism, there's this deep, 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 deep interconnection. So it's like the fingers of the hand. Now they look like they're separate and they're operating separately, but they're not. So each of us, to stretch the metaphor, is a finger on the cosmic hand. <laughs> you know? And that means that anything we can do, anything we can do is helping. You know, like drops of water from the fire hose, each little drop is nothing but together. So yeah, so it's it, almost everybody in this opening it wasn't really a sermon it was just like a big circle talk where everybody said what they were doing and the teachers supposedly taught 
I didn't think it was necessary for us to say anything, but anyway, we did. Um, and <laughs> but yeah, so it's like, you know, each, each little drop together, each little thing that we do, just keep awake, see what you can do, and open your heart to all the suffering, to all the suffering. Don't stand there and think, oh, your suffering isn't as much as their suffering, you know? Don't do that. Everybody who is caught up in all this stuff, how can we open our hearts and how can we hear each other? It's non-trivial as we say in mathematics, but that's our job. And practice gives us the um, this strong center that allows us to do that, that doesn't get us caught up in our own stories, in our own fabrications, in our own likes and our dislikes and our fears. Practice is the thing that gives us this real strength, not, you know, this kind of strength, but real inner strength so that we can take what comes and we can give what's appropriate. So I don't know what set me off on that, but there I was. So. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes, so, and speak really loudly so the people online can hear you. I shall. Thank you. <laughs> um, in the Heart Sutra with the English version, mm -hmm. there's a lot of like, duality. It's like no ignorance, but no absence of ignorance. No this, but not, not that, right? Yeah. But then it turns around and says, however, the, I don't know if you can say it, but the Arjuna apparently said it's perfect, it's true, not false. It, you know, and I just, do you think we're about that? I'm not super familiar with it. But yeah. Is the duality and then the sort of like, but this is the way. Okay. So that's a wonderful question. I've never heard anyone ask it quite that way. It's quite a wonderful question. So in the beginning, what, what you're calling the dualities, that's actually negating the dualities. So it's taking all the things, um, it's saying, know this. So no suffering, no origination, no stopping, no cognition. That's the four, um, the four uh, noble truths, right? Life is suffering. Here's the cause, the origination of suffering. There's a way out of the suffering. This is the way. So it's negating. It's negating all things. No eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. Negating. So it's negating all our assumptions. So it's, in some sense, cutting through duality or multiality or whatever you want to call it. It's cutting through that, saying, no, 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 no. Okay, it's cutting through that. It's pointing what begins with emptiness, and it's always pointing to emptiness. And then, yeah, and then suddenly you have this real, oh, yeah, this is the best thing ever. This is the, forget the translation, you know, the pure bright mantra, the utmost mantra, you know, say this mantra and you know, you'll get rich or something. I'm not quite. <laughs> but um, yeah, because that's, you know, uh, human beings always, we, we always kind of slide back. You know, this is too hard to accept. So you have all this real fantastic, you know, boom, 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 boom. Look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. And then suddenly you relax into this kind of, you know, yeah, supreme mantra. And I love the way, you know, the way it's chanted is supreme mantra instead of supreme mantra, it's supreme mantra, <laughs> which is able to relieve all suffering. And it's true, not false. Doesn't everyone want to relieve their suffering? But of course, this is the mantra that relieves all suffering, not just my suffering or your suffering, all suffering is relieved by this mantra. That's very interesting. So, but the thing is, you know, you have to do it 100%. And how many of us do it 100%? Those of us who are really, have been saying the Heart Sutra for years or decades, you know, speaking for myself, I'm sure I'm not the only one, I'm going to slide off. Oh, are we done? Oh, imagine that. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I'm always promising myself, this time I will really pay attention to every word. <laughs> but that's our life. We have to pay attention to every moment, but we never do. And then we have to be kind to ourselves and understand that as well. But yeah, so we kind of, it's like the, the, what the Heart Sutra is pointing to is so profound and people just can't hold that. So then it slips in. And actually, this is a, this is a standard trope in sutras. There are many, many sutras which will continuously have a paragraph to the effect of if you recite this sutra, you know, every day for whatever, if you recite this sutra wholeheartedly, then you will attain nirvana or you will attain enlightenment or, you know, you'll become rich or whatever it says that. But um, yeah, this thing of, you know, all you have to do is just do this one thing, this one thing. And it's true. All we have to do is do one thing. And then another thing, and then another thing. That's true, you know? So yeah, thank you very much for your question. Are there any other questions? Yes. So how- Loud, loud, loud. <laughs> so how about this works? Like you recite this mantra, all you have to do is recite this mantra, you know, however many hundreds, thousands of times. How does it do that? Have you ever recited a mantra a hundred thousand times? No. Have you ever recited a mantra a thousand times? Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> so Stan had a practice for a while where he was counting great Duranis, right? He was counting, he had a, a little counter, and was it a thousand great Duranis a day? Yeah. And speak loudly and speak about that. <laughs> For three months, I did this practice, non-stop, right around me, for hours and hours a day. I didn't um, come up with this practice on my own. Wait, scooch up here so then you'll be in the microphone, because you're going to talk. Scooch up here. Do you want me to come up here? Yeah, because of the microphone. Okay. <laughs> well, I'd love to sit next to you. No, no, you have to stand facing the computer. <laughs> okay, there you go. Well, first of all, I just realized it was an exaggeration. It was a hundred great Dharanis okay. every day, <laughs> which, uh, which takes a few hours. Uh, we do them all at once. And I did them mostly at midnight. Uh, and mostly outdoors, on our back porch, anyway. <laughs> uh, and uh, it had a very powerful effect. Um, I was uh, instructed to do this because at that time, uh, I was a real mess. Uh, so a mess, but not a real mess. You know? <laughs> you're an imaginary mess. Imaginary mess. You just imagine that you're a mess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, it is a very strong practice, um, and I don't know if you know, all of you are willing to do a hundred a day for a hundred days, but something like that uh, you might try. Uh, maybe just do ten a day for a month. Um, we do this mantra, you know, first because it's traditional. Uh, but also because, well, if you do it, you'll find this to be true. It really does work. How does it work? It's simply sound. These syllables have no meaning. Uh, there are quite a few scholars who have tried to figure out, you know, what the Sanskrit or whatever language meaning might be behind all these syllables. And uh, no one, uh, as far as I know, has accepted any of these uh, explanations. So it's a pure, efficacious sound. Uh, and that's not saying that it's the only pure, efficacious sound, but it's the one we work with. Can I come through again? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, a lot of our practices actually work on this kind of um, subterranean level like prostrations. If you've ever regularly done like 108 prostrations a day, 
or if you're one of those people who does 500 prostrations a day, maybe for a week, maybe for a lifetime, the people with 1,000 prostrations a day. It, and these repetitious mantras, same kind of thing. It works below the conscious level. It's almost like it rewires your nervous system in a way. And um, you can't think when you're doing this kind of thing. You can't think, well, some people say they can think while they're doing prostration. And we're doing these very long repetitions of mantras. It's the same kind of thing. Um, you, your, your thoughts just, I mean, they still are there, but they no longer hold on to you. They no longer grab you and you no longer follow them. You know, for at least this period while you're doing this kind of practice. And, you know, with, um, with chanting practice, you know, you're working with your breath. And with prostrations, you know, you're, you're working with your, your, your center of your body is, is moving and you go down to, you know, that, that posture of complete submission and then you come back up again. And these kinds of things are incredibly powerful. They're really powerful. And a main reason for their power is that they don't operate on a conscious level. They're not something you think about. They're not something you're trying to control. You know, when you're meditating, you know, almost all of us, when we do our meditation, we have some kind of very simplistic practice like counting our breaths or repeating a mantra or, you know, um, some some very repetitious practice you know great question and our our frontal lobes have to be involved to some extent because you have to remember what it is that you're doing you have to bring your mind back to it all the time you have to always bring your mind back to it so there's a little bit more of a, of a connection to you know, our, what I'm calling our frontal lobes, our sort of conscious mind. But these are the practices that's not that kind of connection. As long as you remember what you're doing, you know, as long as you just keep doing what you're doing, there's not that kind of, uh, the, the conscious mind doesn't come into it at all. And that's what gives it its power. It's really extraordinary. So those of you who want to try something like that, you know, talk to me or Stan and we'll give you advice. Yes, I ma'am. I have a question. Oh, Kelly on, on the screen. Oh, Kelly on the screen. Okay, Kelly. Hi, good to see you. Hi, good to see you. I'm still stuck on the paradox of the, um, I'm sorry, after the great Durrani, I'm blanking out on the name of um, um, the, um, the chant that the, the earlier question was about. Uh, the, the paradox of being, to, yeah, all, all of the non-dualities and then the duality mm -hmm. of being told that this is the supreme mantra. Are you saying Dharma that there's... Candy. It's Dharma candy. That's, it's, it's, it's like a motivational element, it's a, a human candy. motivational element. Okay. Dharma candy, okay. yeah. Okay, so not everything that has been handed down through the ages upholds the principles of the practice in the same ways in what some are, sort of what what are the principles of the practice <sighs> <laughs> you put the non-duality right it's point taken but question there are no principles of the practice but okay principles of the practice do the practice yeah so there are many many approaches to the dharma there's many different, you know, if you start reading sutras, you'll see they're written in many different ways. There's some that are very fancy, you know, very fancy language, and some that are very stripped down, and some that have stories, and some that reads like philosophical texts, you know, like the Lankavatara Sutra, it reads like, you know, notes from a Buddhist philosophy class, where um, I'm forgetting the name of the, of the of the guy says, Buddha, would you talk about this? And Buddha talks about this. Okay, Buddha, would you talk about that? Buddha talks about that, you know. So, no, no, not, not in the Lankavatara Sutra. Um, so, yeah, that's the, yeah. Anyway. So, yeah, so, so there's all these, um, 
different approaches. So, <coughs> you know, human beings were very complex and were very changeable. So you need all these different entrances. You need all these different ways to, to touch the Dharma. So there's a place for Dharma candy. And perhaps when you, one thing that I enjoy about your teaching is your sense of humor and your jokes. And perhaps those might be a form of Dharma candy. No, I Not don't everything think, that- <laughs> I, don't think what? Of it. I don't think of it that way. I just like to make jokes. You want to hear Zen Master Sung Sun was hilarious. His, the last Dharma talk I ever heard him give, he was very, very ill at this point. And I think it was the last time he was in the United States. And he was, because um, when he got really sick, he went back to Korea where they knew how to take care of him. And um, so, uh, you know, we, it was a ceremony at Providence Zen Center and there were hundreds of people there. And, you know, you had the lines of the teachers and the monks and the nuns and everything, you know, and it was all very formal and everything. And usually what would happen, he would never be on the program towards the end of his life because you didn't know if he was well enough. And so, um, so when he was going to say something, he talked to the, you know, master of ceremonies, the master of ceremonies get up and say, and now we have a surprise. So the master of ceremonies, and now we have a surprise because he was going to, you know, give this talk. And the whole talk was about a guy picking his nose and flicking the snot on a statue of the Buddha and it landed right here. And then everybody, <laughs> and everybody said, oh, what a precious jewel has appeared on our statue. That was the talk. <laughs> so he was hilarious. And I see that James has a question. What? I can't read it. Oh, your microphone died. Can you put it in the chat? Type it in the chat. Oh, Charlie was speaking about kindness and I spoke about viewing ourselves individually in our practice. I find there are times where the thought that, quote, I should have done more, unquote, in regard to my practice. Could I speak about building the habit of showing kindness to ourselves? Oh, what a wonderful question. Yes, we can always do more. And that's a huge trap. That's an enormous trap. In fact, one of the teachers this morning at the um, at the heart culture said exactly that. It's a huge trap. You know, it's like those um, those Christian monks who beat themselves with you know whatever it is, some kind of wood, little slivers of what? It's yeah, flagellation. But I'm, I'm I'm forgetting what they beat themselves with. Um, you know, because it's never enough, it's never enough, it's never enough, it is never enough, and it's always perfect. It's always just right, you know? So yeah, don't beat yourself up. Whatever, whatever you do, you can always do more, but whatever you do is already enough. But please do more. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, we have we have to be kind to ourselves, and that's that's a big part of you know when we're when we're sitting. That's a big part of our sitting because so many times when we're sitting, we're just so caught up in the terrible things that we've done. I mean, is there anyone here who doesn't do that? Who doesn't think of something you said or something you did that caused pain to another person, or maybe to yourself? If I hadn't said that, I wouldn't have lost my job, you know, whatever it is. Um, so we just look at the things we've done and beat ourselves up where we don't do that. Any recognition at any moment, if instead of getting caught by our thinking, we see our thinking, we see what it is, that's already enough. You don't have to beat yourself up about it. Just, oh, I did that. Okay, that wasn't too good. All right, let's move on. And yeah, you don't, you know, we're, we're lay people. And which means we have responsibilities to others. Which means that we can't let our practice come between us and our responsibilities. It's a very different kind of thing than being in a monastery. And so we have to have that balance where our practice informs our life, but it doesn't hurt the people around us. 
So that's, that's a special difficulty of lay practice, and we have to keep that in mind. I'm not sure, James, did that re respond to what you were thinking? Because you, okay, good, thank you. Oh, Stanley is pointing. Margaret. Oh, Margaret, do you have a question? Your hand isn't up, so I can't see that. <laughs> About the dangers of opposition and arrogance when choosing to heart control. Okay, so you want me to talk about the dangers of arrogance and competition. and competition in the people who are doing heart kill che. Because you have witnessed it many times. I'm repeating because you're. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So don't. Yeah. So don't compete in your practice with anybody. That's a, and not just for heart kilche. Do not ever compete. You know, like I said, there were some people who said, "I'm going to sit five minutes a day." I'm exaggerating on the low side, but it was roughly like that. And other people who said, "Again, I'm exaggerating now on the high side. I'm going to do a thousand bows a day." It doesn't matter. People make whatever commitment they can make. They do whatever they can do. You don't know what someone else's life is. You don't know what someone else's situation is, what their physical situation, what their mental situation, what their emotional situation is. You don't know about the people around them. You have no idea. So how can you judge another person's practice? And don't ever judge your own practice. Oh man, I am the best practitioner. I sit so hard, you know? Don't do that. The minute you do that, you're the worst practitioner, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, this is all about putting all that stuff down. I was gonna use another S word, just put all that down, you know? So yeah. And, you know, this is one reason why we tell people never, you know, people who are working on kangans, never talk to anyone about your kangans, not even your spouse. And there are several married couples, you know, never talk to anyone. Oh, I'm working on the fifth gate. Well, I'm on the seventh gate, you know. <laughs> what? What is this? You know, there's this wonderful saying in, um, in, in classical Chinese literature that makes its way into Zen you know, uh, in, in China and Korea and Japan, if you have a thick lacquer bowl and it breaks, it makes a really big sound. And if you have a thin lacquer bowl and it breaks, it makes a really small sound. So thick lacquer bowl, thin lacquer bowl, doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. So some people have like fantastic visions, fantastic, you know, awakening experiences. And some people, it's so quiet, they don't even notice. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Our responsibility is just to do our best every moment. And never, never, never compare yourself to somebody else. Never, never, never check yourself and compare yourself to an ideal that you have. Just don't do that. It's very destructive. So that's what I'm going to say about that. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, actually, the people who say I'm going to practice another five minutes a day, those are the people that I really... Um, I don't know if admire is the right word, but it's like, because this is somebody who's just starting out, you know, they're stepping into this ocean of dharma and ocean of vows, they're stepping into it. And that's fantastic. Yeah, that's just fantastic. So yeah, don't check anybody. And we're way over time. I see Stanley's looking at his watch, <laughs> way over time. So I'm going to stop it here. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, so we'll stop this and then we'll have the announcements.